This is Bangkok, a city of contrast with action at every turn. It typically welcomes more than 22 million international visitors every year, consistently ranking the Thailand capital as one of the top destinations for global travelers, at one point beating Paris, London and even Dubai. And it doesn't take long to realize why. Its street life, cultural landmarks, a world-class culinary adventure, and red light districts make it a city with infinite layers which you need to explore to reveal its hidden secrets. So without close inspection, you would never know that many buildings in the city form the lifeblood of the prominent Thai gemstone and jewelry industry. This may come as a surprise to many consumers, but a very large portion of the jewelry they see in the US, the EU, the Middle East, Hong Kong and Japan is made in this country that is well known as the stone capital of the world. Colorful gemstones such as sapphires, rubies and emeralds may glitter, but the world behind these gemstones look a lot less attractive. A conservative estimate of the global annual market for rough colored gemstones, the term used to describe uncut and polished stones, valued the sector at about 20 billion US dollars. However, the supply chain for the gemstones appear to be a classic textbook example of unequal distribution. The farther back you go in the chain, the less people earn. The gemstones are often mined in the poorest developing countries. They then go to slightly less poor developing countries, which are traditional processing centers such as Thailand, India, Sri Lanka and China, where they are cut and polished. Finally, they are sold in the wealthy West. Africa is a prominent supplier of gemstones, large-scale by artisanal and small-scale mining operators with makeshift equipment, mostly because gem deposits are typically small, which means they are short-lived and therefore not appropriate for large-scale mining operations. In the streets of Bangkok, mostly Asian as well as some African gemstone traders plus their transnational networks remain hidden away from the more public face of this cosmopolitan city, silently fueling a clandestine trade that often skirts the law while providing livelihoods for millions on both sides of the Indian Ocean. Dubbed the Ruby Trading Kingdom, Thailand is one of the world's major processing centers for colored gemstones with an advantage in exquisite polishing skills and fine craftsmanship which enhances the color of the finished gems. The handiwork cannot be replaced by automated equipment. The country plays an especially prominent role in ruby and sapphire supply chains. But you see, the Thai gemstone industry is heavily dependent on African rough colored gemstones. However, However, official trade records fail to reflect the immense scale of the trade. This is because the secretive nature of flows, often done by underreporting both the quantity and the value of the gemstones. Most African colored gemstones are moved and declared through informal channels or are underdeclared in official channels. For example, Madagascar is an important source of sapphires and other gemstones, supplying the Thai industry for over two decades. Its vast deposits hold an array of precious and semi-precious gemstones. In fact, it is estimated that only 10% of the country is not gem-bearing. After the discovery of brilliant blue sapphires in the 1990s, numerous gem rushes ensued and Madagascar became the center of the sapphire universe. But it has only recently started to be included as a source country in official Thai trade records. The sapphire trade in Madagascar is dominated by foreign buyers, mostly Sri Lankans, who have little interest in any value addition in the country. It is alleged the traders maintain a cartel system to ensure local prices are suppressed, maximizing profits for foreign traders. More valuable Malagasy stones are purchased and then traded in Thailand or Sri Lanka, where they are processed and even rebranded as Sri Lankan, according to the International Gemological Institute, IGI. 
2017 saw Mozambique, which accounts for up to 80% of global ruby production, precipitate a major disruption in the trade when the government launched an offensive against illegal mining and trade in gemstones, arresting 3,600 people. Many foreign buyers, mainly Tanzanians, Thais, Sri Lankans and Guineans were arrested. As a result of this crackdown, rubies immediately ran into scarce supply in the Thai market. Elsewhere, according to the OECD Due Diligence Guidance for Responsible Supply Chains of Minerals from Conflict-Affected and High-Risk Areas, rough, green, pink and dual-colored tourmaline stones mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo are purchased in Rwanda. A typical trade route is reportedly from Goma Eastern DRC to Rwanda, then to Bangkok. According to the Gems and Jewelry Institute of Thailand, Thai dealers have a history of owning mines in Africa and dealing directly with African miners to whom they pay cash, making them a reliable trading partner for local miners. But with time, they started to use intermediary traders, most often the African or Indian nationals. West Africans, especially Guineans and increasingly Nigerians, are heavily represented in this segment of the Thai gemstone trade. At the receiving end, Thailand has a liberal policy on the import of colored gemstone rough. At customs, there is no requirement to show proof of the provenance of the stones, how they've been acquired, or that appropriate export royalties or fees have been paid in the country of origin or transit. In short, legal or illegal, it's not a problem for the Thai government. The simple reason for this attitude is economics. As the world's third largest colored stone exporter, the industry is creating well over a million jobs in Thailand. At the same time, Thailand's dominance of global trade in gemstones is also being threatened by ever-increasing competition from other established and emerging gemstone hubs. Currently, competitors such as Hong Kong and Jaipur, India are increasingly reducing the speed of the Thai gravy train. Therefore, it is unlikely that the Thai government will look to tighten regulations and risk pushing traders to seek other, easier-to-access jurisdictions to sell their uncut gems. As Bangkok's governor once put it, Thailand is the gemstone king and it needs to maintain these status. India, on the other hand, is the second largest global importer of colored gemstones, both polished and rough. The country has a long history of activity in the African colored gemstone sector. According to information from the Indian embassies in Zambia and Madagascar, there are currently 100,000 Indians residing in both countries. Most of them have trading companies, while others have established factories. Another wild example is Tanzania. You see, Tanzanite is a precious gemstone that changes color in different lighting conditions. Although deposits are not found anywhere else in the world apart from Tanzania, the country is not the biggest exporter of the rare gemstone. Tanzania comes a distant third behind India and Kenya. Obviously, smuggling is one of the primary reasons for this. The informal nature of the colored gemstone trade combined with the inherent difficulty in valuing rough stones at the site of extraction provides ample opportunity for criminal and corrupt actors to rip off poor source countries. The substantial amount of smuggling activity results in a significant challenge to establishing secure supply chains that are needed to improve conditions for miners and other upstream actors. Furthermore, working conditions are dangerous, child labor is used in some sites, women experience discrimination, and there is widespread failure to rehabilitate mined areas. So, while smugglers may provide an immediate livelihood option to vulnerable populations who desperately need the income, this is at the long-term expense of the rule of law and establishing sustainable, fairly paid livelihoods for miners and those who help process the stones locally. As a result, criminal control over this sector, especially by foreign actors, has deprived Africa of much of the potential economic benefits of the gemstone industry. 
Thailand reported imports from Nigeria, Rwanda, Madagascar and Mozambique fall far below expectations. Madagascar and Mozambique's export trade data reveal a similar trend, while Nigeria and Rwanda record almost no data on colored gemstone exports since 2015. When estimates of the actual value of the trade and official trade data are compared, the scale of smuggling in the industry is striking. This is a multi-billion dollar transnational industry thriving in the shadows and it's worth noting that the lack of trade data and low or doctored numbers provided by Sri Lanka are even more concerning. From 2014 to 2018, Sri Lanka recorded colored gemstone imports only from Madagascar valued at 1 million US dollars. In contrast, during that same time period, Sri Lanka reported exporting a staggering 86 million to 153 million dollars each year. While Sri Lanka is a gemstone producer, the reporting gaps and discrepancies in trade figures raise a red flag. All in all, the transnational networks underpinning the global colored gemstone trade are largely hidden, not well understood, and don't receive the same level of attention given to other precious minerals. The gold and diamond trade, for example, were thrust into the public consciousness in the 1990s with global campaigns around blood diamonds, resulting in the establishment of the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme to prevent conflict diamonds from entering the mainstream diamond market. By contrast, colored gemstone supply chains, transnational dealings, and often illegal networks linking their source and destination countries have so far received little to no attention. There you go guys, this video was made possible by my incredible patrons over at Patreon. So if you'd like to support the channel in any way, you can visit my Patreon or PayPal links in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.